So in lecture, we've seen a lot of different examples of positive and negative feedbacks, but I thought it might be useful to take a minute and review how they work and what their consequences are. And remember that this course is really about being able to use lo logic and apply what you learn to new situations. So while I'm going to walk through some examples we've seen in class, think about applying this concept to a variety of examples. All right, so in general, what are we talking about when we say negative and positive feedback? So let's say negative feedback. and positive feedbacks. So when we're talking about um, in biology or really any uh, situation, um, if a change occurs, we're really thinking about how um, systems respond to change. So if a change occurs, negative feedback is going to minimize or reduce change. while positive feedback is going to encourage or amplify that change. Okay, so let's go over negative feedback. So an example we were, ta we were given in class was thermoregulation. And we talked a little bit about why thermoregulation uh, might be important or useful uh, to ourselves. So, you know, maintaining this internal temperature is a uh, you know, creates this kind of uh, beneficial constant temperature, um, which can deal with, um, allows us to deal, or organisms that, that thermoregulate to deal with um, varying climate or temperature, um, right? So how does this work? So we have some internal body temperature or um, set point, right? I'll just put capital T for temperature, right? And for humans, it's about 98 degrees. Uh, but this applies to a lot of organisms that are endotherms. They have some body uh, temperature that's a set point, and they have uh, some way of detecting that. Their bot system, system has some way of detecting that. And if they get too hot, um, their body senses that. They have some detection, um, some something in their nervous system that will detect that and will um, basically turn on some either behavior or um, physiology to offset that temperature increase. So for example, one physiological adaptation um, we have, humans have, is we start sweating, right? So you sweat, uh, you perspire, and that um, having, you know, producing water on your skin and that evaporating actually cools your body uh, temperature down. So uh, it, it returns your body uh, to this, um, your set point. And once your body returns to the set point, um, you know what you stop sweating, right? So this is a, a feedback that, that keeps your body at a, a certain temperature. And conversely, if it gets too cold, Again, your body has a way of detecting whether you're getting too cold, and one uh, physiological adaptation we have is our, we start shivering. We start to shiver. And so if, if you know what shivering is, it's kind of this, you, you don't really control it, you just start shivering. It's your muscles contracting very rapidly, which produces um, heat uh, as they're contracting. And so you're, it's this way to produce heat, which can then raise your body temperature back up to the set point. And again, once you get your body temperature back up to the set point, your, um, your nervous system senses that and you stop shivering, right? So this negative feedback um, maintains this kind of internal temperature. So you can guess that negative feedbacks are going to be important in homeostasis. And what's homeostasis again? Homeostasis. So homeostasis is the maintenance of uh, some constant internal temperature, right? So the homeostasis is the ability of an individual to maintain some relatively constant internal conditions, uh, and it's really useful when we're trying to offset a varying environment. And how does our environment vary? Well, it varies in seasons, uh, it varies during the day, uh, we have daily cycles, um, tides, right? So there's these constant and predictable changes, um, but also we might have some kind of unpredictable changes such as disturbances. Um, which we might want to offset. And again, why, why do we want to maintain these constant conditions? Um, it turns out that uh, a lot of our um, chemistry and the way our body, bodies work um, have kind of optimal conditions. So if we're able to maintain those optimal conditions, uh, then we can be active um, longer uh, than you know, organisms that, that aren't able to maintain those um, desirable conditions. Um, but So that's a benefit, but you can think about the costs, right? What are the costs? It costs a lot of energy, right? This whole system of keeping your body at a certain temperature, it, you know, 
you have to have a system in place to detect the temperature changes. Once you have a temperature change, um, you have you it you know requires energy to either you know produce sweat or to shiver and to maintain that kind of um, body temperature. So it is um, there are some benefits and costs, and you you want to think about that as you move forward and think about other examples. Okay, um, so let's talk about positive feedbacks um, briefly. So. Um, Positive feedbacks. So we were introduced to positive feedbacks. Um, the first time we were introduced to it was actually um, not necessarily in a um, thinking about bodily systems, but thinking more about the environment. Um, and again, remember that positive feedbacks encourage or amplify uh, change, right? But since then, we've seen um, some examples of positive feedback in bodily systems. Um, so let's um, think about um, the first example we saw, was, which was the Arctic ice and global climate change. So Dr. Hamilton um, was talking about sea ice and climate change. And uh, at the poles, we have two things. I'm going to have my little mock-ups. Okay, so this is, if you imagine looking down at the Earth uh, from the, let's say, the North Pole, right? So here's the North Pole right here. I'll just put a little North Pole. Okay. Um, so we have two things at the poles. We have water, so that's the blue, and we have ice, right? So the ocean is uh, from afar looks blue, uh, or even from close up looks blue, and then ice is white, right? And Dr. Hamilton was talking about how we have this positive feedback in terms of temperature, the amount of sea ice, and what we call albedo. Okay, so albedo is just um, the amount of um, light that gets reflected. Oops, how much sunlight is reflected. So things that are um, have a high albedo reflect a lot of light. And so um, it tends, ten, turns out that light things like the color white, um, so light colors uh, tend to reflect a lot of light whereas dark colors absorb a lot of light. Um, and this of course you can think about uh, ex changes the temperature. Um, so the more light you're absorbing, the more heat you're also absorbing. So if you think about being in Phoenix, if we are going to uh, go out, if you're going to go out and do something outside in the middle of the summer, you'd probably want to wear um, a light t-shirt and light clothes um, because those would then reflect uh, a lot of the sunlight. Whereas if you went outside dressed all in black uh, in Phoenix, uh, you'd get uh, overheated really quickly um, because we just had just absorbing so much light and heat. Okay, so so here we have, um, I'm just going to sketch out, so we have um, the amount of ice, right? So ice has a very high albedo, right? So the amount of ice at the poles is going to affect um, the amount of albedo. So the more ice we have, the, the more albedo, right? The more uh, light that's being reflected. So I'm just going to put a little positive, right? They, this relationship is a, a positive correlation. The more ice you have, the, m the higher the albedo is, right? Um, they change in the same way. Conversely, the less ice you have, the less albedo you're going to have, right? Okay. Um, so then, so albedo, as we mentioned, is also related to temperature. Right, so the more albedo you have, right, the more light you reflect, the lower your temperature is going to be because as the light's being reflected, um, that temperature is, uh, it's not absorbing as much solar radiation and so your temperature is going to be lower. Um, and then the relationship to finally kind of close this loop, the temperature um, is of course related to the amount of ice, right? Um, and this is also a negative relationship because the higher your temperature, the lower, the, the less ice you're going to have, right? The, the, um, as your temperatures increase, your ice is going to start melting and decreasing. And so just to walk through how this, um, you know, when there's a perturbation, when there's a change, how this affects um, this cycle and, and what ends up happening um, to the cycle. So we talked about that. I'm just going to uh, take this in kind of steps. So we talked about, okay, so what happens if you increase the temperature at the poles? Okay, so an increase in temperature is going to lead to a decrease in the amount of ice. And I'm just going to go ahead. So this is our initial stage, and then we can go ahead and shave off some of this ice, let's say. Okay. Oh, so now we have less ice. Okay. So you can see that the percentage of ice, or the ratio of ice to water has changed, right? There's less of this of ice and more of this uh, water that's going to, that's darker and will absorb um, solar radiation. So the albedo is going to actually uh, also decrease, right? So as the albedo decreases, then what happens? Well, if we're 
absorbing more light, right? If we're reflecting less light, absorbing more light, the, temp the, the temperatures are going to continue to increase, right? Right. So then as the con temperature continues to increase, more ice is going to melt. Shave off a little more of our ice caps. Obviously, this is just a model, so it's not <laughs> going to go this quickly. Um, and as, of course, now we have less ice, less sunlight reflected, more sunlight being absorbed um, from the water, from the dark water. And so your albedo is uh, decreasing, um, which and then you can see this cycle is just going to continue uh, to uh, uh, basically it, can, it encourages itself. It kind of feeds back on itself and um, amplifies itself. So this was an issue with, with uh, temperature change or climate change at the poles. You have this positive feedback, which just amplifies the loss of um, the ice caps. Okay, So that's an example of positive feedback. But we can talk about positive feedback. We've seen some examples in bodily systems. We've talked about breastfeeding and how um, the, um, when, when the body uh, senses a, a baby breast suckling, it releases uh, certain hormones, which then release um, uh, breast milk. And uh, that, that, that uh, which will then increase, of course, the, the baby suckling because now it's getting milk. It continues to suckle. And so this is a, a positive feedback, um, just continually uh, in releasing uh, milk uh, in response to the suckling. And you can think about, okay, how might we have in biological systems, we might want to have some way of um, stopping this positive feedback at some point. Um, so how might we have that? So, for example, in the example of uh, breastfeeding, once the baby stops suckling, then you might expect um, this positive feedback to stop. Um, so when you think, so moving, just thinking about going forward, um, so just think about, you know, we've seen a lot of examples of positive and negative feedbacks and probably we'll see more in the future. And so just think about, you know, when is it beneficial to have a negative feedback, right? When do you want to reduce change? You know, we talked about homeostasis. We, we, there's a lot of different um, uh, uh, systems that respond that are responsible for homeostasis right not just so we don't aren't just thinking also about temperature we're also thinking about chemistry you know the ph of your blood um, the levels of oxygen the levels of uh, sugar in your uh, bloodstream things like that um, are important for homeostasis are we also want to maintain internal temperatures for so you know when would we want a negative feedback to maybe regulate some of those um, internal temperature or internal conditions and when would we want a positive feedback right when would we want um, change to uh, be amplified or encouraged um, moving forward um, so so think about those things when you're uh, respond when you are um, exposed to kind of new examples uh, you know would we would we want a positive or negative feedback in this case um, and also think about some of the issues with positive and negative feedbacks right again positive feedbacks when how do you um, stop the positive feedback from just continuing right um, in this example um, with the ice you know it's not necessarily a bodily uh, system but is there a way that we would be able to stop this positive feedback um, if, in, in biological systems and your in, in bodily systems you might think that you'd want some sort of um, something to um, be built in maybe to, to stop um, the positive feedbacks at some point. Okay, so hope that helps and uh, yeah.